that I've, <laughs> it's kind of changed my focus here is that uh, previously I was focusing on just making a, a particular company a lot better, but now I see that it may be a vehicle uh, towards other things too. And also, uh, I think an attitude of, of uh, not really allowing or accepting incompetence and putting more uh, responsibility with other people is also something that, uh, you know, is kind of impressed upon me here, even though I've heard it all my life. Um, I think the only, uh, the uh, price that may be hard to go beyond is at the point of alienating people that are close to me. I don't know if that's uh, a line I would go beyond to achieve success, because that would be kind of against my definition of success, but I think I got a lot of good stuff out of the seminar here. Okay. <clears throat> uh, well, as far as is the price I would be willing to pay to accomplish my goals, it's anything that's with the anything at all within the bounds of the, the legal, ethical, moral caveat. Um, w one of the things I've gotten here is to it, it, I've just gone through a little different situation. I'm in a situation right now, it'd be kind of easy to sit back for a while and cruise. And I've got to go for the bigger goals and keep charging ahead and face the fact that what I've done is not that damn great and keep going and turn it into something great. One of the, the easiest things to do, and I've alluded to it a few times in the last two and a half days, is that people that have attained some degree of success to sit back on their laurels and pat themselves on the back <clears throat> and uh, the, a difficult uh, thing to do is to immediately refocus your energies and and go on to do something else. And uh, the uh, but uh, I, I think that he's 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 hit upon it very accurately. <coughs> yes, sir. Um, listening to you today, I think uh, for, I've taken a lot of chances in the past, but last last few years it's been. I've been pretty playing it really safe and comfortable and being thoroughly pissed off with myself. What you've helped me to do is realize, you know, it, it's scary. I'm going to be stepping into a whole new field and the buck's going to stop with me. And, I, you know, I know a lot of people, they, you know, they're saying, oh, they're great, but, you know, it's scary for me. <laughs> it's not, I'm going to do it, but that's, it's it's just part of it. I'm just going to have to uh, be scared, and but go ahead and and do it. You know, just take full responsibility for the project, and uh, if it goes bad, take full responsibility for it. Um, I guess that's that's about it. Uh, you've turned me into the dominator. <laughs> the dominator. That's good. Okay. Yeah, Dan. Uh, I had already made a lot of decisions before I came to the seminar. I've been in the same computer business now for about 14 years. I've been in the industry now for over 25 years. And the company is either going to go on the market or I'm going to give equity to some key employees, let them run in and walk away from it. Uh, prior to your seminar, I had already made decisions to uh, move into a different career in the real estate and, and retail market area. And I'm going back to Texas to do that and down in Mexico. So decisions had already been made. So I'm just going forward with what I have to do. I know exactly what I have to do. The mentors that you talked about, I already have those in place. And I already have the qualifications, the background that I need. I just need to go find the money. And I know how to do that. I can sell it. Good. Um, I'm willing to do anything, anything, to, to get what I want. And that, that's the bottom line. The question was, what price are you willing to pay? And I've been sitting here thinking, and I've, I, I, I don't know what price I'm willing to pay because I've already paid all the prices. I've already, uh, you can't get any lower than where I came from. We were in a hard charging mode before we got here. We were already on fast pace and already in hyperdrive. Um, so it's not what price I have to pay. It's just some of the things that we have to go back and get done, which used to seem rather large, now seem rather small. Um, Basically, uh, we're going to go home and see if we just can't make a mess out of things more. That's all. <laughs> Only a bigger mess. And I, I want to tell you, I mean, I've been in the seminar business, being in the training business. I run across a lot of people, and, and uh, the people I associate with all have good things to say, and they all are real people. But uh, the event for the, from the last three days is the culmination 
it is the uh, high end, it is the point to where uh, I've been trying to arrive in what I've been doing in the past and uh, I couldn't, if there's two words in the English language to describe the title of your seminar, I don't know how we could have done it better than Quantum Leap. For those who are ready, and I understand that some aren't, but uh, it just happened to hit us. Of course, we knew before we came here you were going to screw us up, so it's nothing. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Well, I'm already a leg up on a lot, uh, a lot of folks here. I'm already a family maverick, haven't had much to do with them brothers and sisters for uh, probably 20 years and uh, my immediate family they think I'm nuts because I do crazy things in real estate and it's not supposed to work and but we make it work so I guess what I really have to do I don't have to worry much about you know about that side but I do have <coughs> to uh, reevaluate some of some of my acquaintances I guess and maybe some of the associations and organizations that I belong to uh, you know, kind of the moron type things, and no, seriously, and uh, I be believe me, and, I believe, I know. Yeah, and start running, you know, start running with the big dogs. Uh, I never really did care much what people thought. I mean, that was never a concern of mine. I don't plan to give up any association with the female companion of it that I have, though. Uh, does it even matter if she's a moron or not? No, that's, that's true. No. Sure not. No. Sure not. <laughs> moron Some, or not, you stay. <laughs> so, someday you'll understand why. Okay. Okay. Uh, I thank you very kindly for the uh, three days. Very, very enlightening and uh, rewarding. Thank you. I like to stand up when I talk. Well, that's because well, that's, you look the same high for the stand up too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, what the hell's the difference? That's right. Why is this? Speaker. Speaker. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, in this um, three day event that I've taken part in, um, I have gone home with Dan uh, to my home. I bring them with me uh, into my sleeps and my dreams, I and I, I <laughs> and I, um, I haven't been able to really uh, sleep. I haven't been able to really eat because uh, that's not important. Eating and sleeping, so physical. Um, but what I wanted to say is, Dan, I have already given up so much. Anyway, I have. Uh, I've always known that my success was going to cost. Sometimes you don't know in detail exactly what you have to give up to get there. But um, I always knew where I wanted to go. So I have given up a lot. I have lost three grandmothers. Um, I've taken myself away from my family, which means a lot to me, and um, came out to California by myself with a husband and uh, three children. Um, I think I've done a really good job with my children. They're all pretty successful. They all know their, their talents and their gifts from God. And, uh, but what I've learned from this seminar, it kind of put the frosting on the cake for me. I just got back from a vacation in New York and on the flight home, something said inside, en well, I hope you enjoyed your trip because now is when the work really starts. I always knew that I was getting in the way. I never put the responsibility on anyone else but myself. I always, I always clarified myself or what I validated myself was by through my work. My work is always valuable to me. Uh, someone saying I've done a good job, someone saying not just Naima, but great Naima or fantastic Naima, that meant so much to me. So what I think I'm willing to give up now at this stage is a little piece of my business to allow it to grow. Uh, seek a dream team, which has always been in my plans. Uh, I need a mentor and I'm going to pursue a mentor, a mentor maybe that's retired, that uh, doesn't have a lot on his desk, and will have a chance to run around with me a little bit and we'll have some fun. Um, but anyway, I wanna be a, uh, I've always felt myself as being a trailblazer, and that's what I'm gonna do. So I don't think I have to give up too much inside my home. I'll still keep uh, my better half, moron or whatever. And, um, significant other, that's the new word. Yes. 
So um, I don't think he's never stood in my way. He's always told me I've been a Harriet Tubman. And if anyone knows who Harriet Tubman was, she was a slave uh, who escaped, who went back into the um, South and rescued like over a thousand slaves. So my husband has always referred to me as Harriet Tubman. And he's never allowed me to cry on his shoulder, no matter what job I had. It's always, Naima, you want it? Okay, you've got it, and don't cry to me. So that's, that's what I plan to do. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, Dan, I consider myself a contrarian, liking myself to a ram in a lot of ways. And uh, if people say I can't do certain things, like in athletics, I go ahead and do it. And uh, I have had a commitment to certain athletic events and laser beam focus and a discomfort zone while I've been participating. And uh, I haven't transferred that into business yet, but I'm willing to do what it takes to do that and uh, to get rid of the negative people in my life, be it family, friends, or associates, to uh, carry that through. And uh, this three days has been very enlightening and uh, enriching in my life, and I'd like to thank you again, Dan. Thank you. <clears throat> well, for me, um, I already, at a young age, I sort of broke out of that cultural cocoon that um, I was placed in being the only daughter. and. Um, after I did that, I was made everyone else in my family very uncomfortable, um, and then, but was very happy about what I did, being independent. And now I found that I'm at a level where I need to go 110 percent and and work that extra more, so that way I can achieve the dreams that I haven't even maybe put into the big picture yet. So I need to be focused and uh, you know continue being. The, the one and only like I've been in my family. Thank you. L let me make a comment while, um, while it's uh, fresh in my mind. A lot of you have already, that, that we've, we've talked to you so far, said that you've already, you've been a person that has gone against conventional wisdom. You've already made your uh, um, a commitment to yourself to do this and that. But what, you, what you're really saying, and the reason why you're not a high performance person yet, does anybody know why? Well, no. No, no. Your expectations are too low. Expectations for yourself are too low. I've heard 10, 12, 15 people here say that I'm willing to do this. I've always been willing to do this. I've always been a da 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 da. Well, then why in God's name then aren't you a high performance person? Because your expectations are in the toilet. It's all about self-esteem. It's all about feeling good about yourself. If that doesn't change, you've already, either you're all lying or you're telling the truth and you got low expectations. There's one of the two. There, I mean, it, it, you can't have it both ways. On that simple note, carry on. Thank you. I married into a uh, religious culture where you went to church often. And culture or cult? What? Culture. Oh. And you went to church often and you said, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. It occurred to me one day what I was saying. I went home and I said, I am never going to say that again and I will not be back. I explained it to my three kids because they knew I would go to hell if I didn't go back. And I said, that's my decision. You do what you want. They said... Thank God, Mom. <laughs> We've been waiting for ages for somebody to come up with this. But the conditioning part is really important. <coughs> Several years later, I'm at my mother-in-law's funeral, and I say, and I am not... I started to say it, and I went, <clears throat> just like that, in the middle of a funeral. So you're right about the conditioning. It'll slip up this on you. This would have been in Latin, would it? <laughs> <laughs> That's <Yeah>. right. Um, <laughs> What am I going to do? I know. Uh, I already said that my, my first event this month was to listen to Dan. I'm sorry, in October. I went home and I said, we're changing the program, but we've got to investigate. You go learn this. I'm going to go learn this. You go learn this. You go learn this. When I get home, we have a meeting scheduled on Friday with our associate who doesn't know yet that he's our customer for the practices. Mm -hmm. Between now and Friday, we will structure the transaction that 
uh, will entice him to take it over. And Dan, we've done this several times. We've gone into other ventures. We've, we've, um, I don't like to use the word fail, but we've experienced a lot of learning at them. And you know what? So what? It just doesn't mean spit. You're right. You just got to go do more. That's exactly right, because it's all about transactions. I mean, again, Babe Ruth leading the uh, home runs, leading strikeouts. You know, he was the highest paid. He got paid more than the president, if I remember correctly, back whenever he did. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> After calling my job last night and finding how many hours I get for next week, um, you know, already, you know, Dan already told me to quit, and. Mike told me to quit, and my brother told me to quit. Um, next Monday, well, Monday, I mean... Um, the after tomorrow. Yeah, I'm going to quit. I'm going to give him a week's notice and say, screw you. Very good. And you'll feel good, especially when you tell him the screw you part. <laughs> <laughs> well, you asked a question, <clears throat> what price are we willing to pay? all that I can give. That's basically what I want to pay to get done what I need to do. And uh, <clears throat> I've been on a path of unconventionalism for a year and two months now with this business that I'm involved in, right, uh, network marketing. I took, I chose that business because it was uh, unconventional. I knew that I couldn't be what I wanted to be doing things the conventional way. I had to break the mold. And uh, some people don't think I can do it. Um, I, I believe in myself and, uh, and this company and my products, and I'm going to do it. And uh, I'm going to take it. The only thing that I could say that I've done wrong thus far is my expectations have not been high enough. I have to go for a million a month. That's, what I'm, that's my goal. And I know I can do it. So I've, I've learned that from you, and I owe it all to you if I, if I ever get there. Thank you. Thank you. When you get there, when you yeah, get there. When I get there. Let me make a comment about uh, expectations again. You know, how many of you ever sold life insurance? Geez, only two of us? But this is a higher class group than I thought. Okay. Okay. Why do you think that, you know, the million dollar round table and that kind of stuff? Did you ever think, what if it was the $100 million round table or the billion dollar round table? When I was selling insurance, as soon as I, you know, I. I because it was one of the products on Wall Street, I wasn't fully committed to selling life insurance. And I, I made that suggestion, and I didn't know anything about the structure of like the seminar now, because this was two, almost 20 years ago. And they told me that, that you can't do that, it's never been done, Prudential won't do it. And today, they still got the million dollar round table. When you, when you see the uh, football games that are sponsored uh, on Channel 7, they say that $1,000 is being donated to the scholarship fund of Oklahoma State. They've been given $1,000 now for 38 years. $1,000, you know, what? Conditioning. The same $1,000 in 1955 meant something. The same $1,000 in 1994 doesn't mean spit. I don't know what the hell you can buy for $1,000 in college now. But it's conditioning. It's the same, the same, the same. More of the same, and you're going to get more of the same. Excuse me, go ahead, please. I have to finish writing, please. Oh, okay. Excuse me. <laughs> well, I originally um, came here for this weekend for uh, the benefit of my son. I thought he had to make some uh, life choices, and I made a few myself. And while I've been here, I mean, I've already had a big dream. Um, on my uh, sheet, I said that in 10 years we'd like to have a 1,000 stores. And I've, I've doubled that now. Also, while I've been here, my loan came through. Everything's hawked. And uh, I've also been appointed the uh, training director for the uh, company uh, yesterday morning with, by, by the, uh, the main principals in the company, as well as in my own um, Bay Area thing. So I'm going to um, read my notes every day for a long time and uh, I've got a good team and uh, it's certainly nice to have met all you wonderful people too. Thank you. Well I fall into the category of people who has paid the price, achieved success, 
but by other people's measurement, not by my own, because the vehicle in which I was successful didn't give me the lifestyle, didn't allow me the lifestyle that I wanted. And I have known for a long time that I wanted to do something different because I'm not challenged and I know I'm not using all my potential, but it took me a long time to figure out what I wanted to do. And it also uh, took me a long time to decide to go back in there and start paying that price again because I know how hard that was. And I um, was also did not read that uh, uh, article that the big doctor, the good doctor talked about that it's normal to, and healthy to change your career every 10 years. I was conditioned by my family that when you're successful in something, it's irresponsible to give it up. And then I started hearing things like, you have to give up something to get something better. But I didn't quite, couldn't quite get myself to do it. And I had made up my mind to do it when I went to that seminar, and I went there seeking information. And um, when I saw you, I realized that um, what you had to offer was the, the teeth and the reinforcement that the ideas that I've always felt are okay to feel because I have achieved whatever success I achieved by the attitudes, many of the attitudes that you've had, but I didn't know it was okay to have those attitudes because uh, I was the rebel all the time. Excuse me for interrupting. It's, e it's even less okay in, in, in society if you're a woman to have attitudes like mine. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, th you're thought to be a rank bitch I mean, and I use this, and that was, Burl is a perfect example of that, because, I mean, women that are high-performance people that don't care what other people think, just think about that. Exactly. I mean, I mean, it, it is, it's a dichotomy. I mean, it's, 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 it's not possible in today's society. And that's why there's so few high-performance women. Right. Just, I mean, I tell the story, there's one Fortune 500 high, uh, one Fortune 500 CEO that's a woman today. In 1971 uh, um, or 72, Lillian Affinito was the first Fortune 500 CEO woman, and who's a friend of mine, and she was for Singer Sewing Machine. There's still only one, 22 or 23 years later. There's still only one, and um, the it's it's because the, the, it's a dichotomy. I mean, women because of their conditioning, they've even got more goofball conditioning than we than the men in general, because they're supposed to do this, they're supposed to do that, they're not supposed to do this, they're not supposed to do that, and so you're right. I mean, it it is okay to think that way, and uh, to be in a put yourself in a position. To, you know, be all that you can be. Uh, I have all, all, also always felt like I was a visitor from another planet looking in at, at, <laughs> at things that made no sense to me. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't had the, um, the good fortune to find many pe any people like you in my life to, to, to change my association to be with. I am always the exception. I'm always the one that people are draining the energy and wanting from me. And uh, uh, so... Uh, I have always known what I had to do, but I just, you know, <clears throat> couldn't provide myself the facility to do it, and I made up my mind that I was going to go and seek whatever it was I needed, no matter where I had to go. And uh, so I'm here, and um, I, want, I, I think it's a real tribute to you, especially because you don't have to do what you do, and nobody else in, at your position would do it, because they, they don't care enough. They have Amen. what they want. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, I, I didn't do that. I didn't say that to flatter you because no, I know you don't I mean agree. that. I agree. But I mean sincerely. But the other thing is that's why I can be as candid as I am. Because I mean, because I don't care what the morons say. I mean, I just don't. I'm not, you know, it just, it, it, and I got into the business because I, I can do that. I can put myself in a position to, to give you the, the straight poop and the candid talk. I mean, uh, I forget somebody told me uh, in San Diego, or maybe they told Ed, that, um, that the reason, one, they thought one of the reasons I was able to be so candid is because I didn't have to really make a living doing this. I like to make money at everything I do, 
And the reason, you know, before when I did it for 15, 18 years, I did it for nothing. I didn't know anybody paying me to do this. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a mitzvah, it's a miracle. Most people um, who have the facility, even if they're friends of yours, and even if, even if you are doing business with them, they don't want you to know anything because they're fearful that you might have the intelligence to, to do m as much or more than they've already done, and then that would hurt their ego. So uh, I've noticed that. So even among the people that I know who are successful, they're not willing to give the information because they're fearful that maybe they're not as smart as they, maybe they were lucky, just like you said, and maybe someone else will come along and surpass them, and that won't do You're hanging around with the wrong big dogs then, because there's plenty of big dogs that'll share information. But there are a lot of big dogs that are selfish, insecure and know they couldn't do it again. She's absolutely accurate and I've alluded to that a half a dozen times in the last three days. There are a number of them and I've been, you know, not blessed because I go out and find them. I mean, the ones that have helped me in my career and I continue to go out and find them. And when I give guidance to other people, like the young kids to, to go call on Jerry Buss, who was thrilled. Nobody called him in 25 years. It's unbelievable when you think about it. <clears throat> Well, in terms of paying the price, um, I realize that, and I have always realized, but now it's just more reinforced, thank you, that you pay the price now or you pay the price later. I mean, there's no getting away from it. I mean, you, you, you pay the price by either uh, not knowing that you didn't, you aren't the best you can be, uh, knowing that you uh, haven't accomplished all that you <coughs> could, and also uh, you know, not having the kind of money to afford you the kind of lifestyle that you want. And, and I've always been the kind of person that felt the last thing I want to do is, you know, be an old lady in a nursing home thinking about what I didn't do. So, um, I'm going to suck... thought to pay everybody the place in their mind. <laughs> I'm going to suck in old my... Old lady or an old man in a nursing yeah. home. So I'm going to suck in my pantyhose, to, to coin a phrase, <laughs> to right. chop your phrase, and just pay the price. Dude. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, like I was going to just stand up here and blow smoke up my ass and say I was willing to do anything. Um, but I wanted to quantify that and, and um, so like the, st like the uh, seven steps you have to success the tape program, I have my seven prices to pay um, this month. I'm going to close my business, so I'm not going to waste time selling it. It's not worth it. Um, I'm going to move out. Uh, I'm going to move without a forwarding address. Um, I'm not going to let my family or my doofus friends know where I am. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell, well, what I'm going to do is I'll tell my mother and father, I'll give, give my mother and father a call, I'll also mention to them that um, it's not a phase, I'm not going to have, not, they should stop waiting for grandchildren, I don't want children, and I'm not going to have children. It's not a phase. Uh, yeah, I thought, you know, next year. I understand. Okay, um, and I'm, I've already canceled all my vacations on the break. Um, I'm going to burn most of my clothes and ask Linda where to shop. And, uh, Ooh, that's <laughs> the heaviest commitment of them all. <laughs> um, throw away 90% of my files and my books. Uh, and I've already taken a step to do this. I'm going to drop out, drop out of the doctoral program I'm in for education. It's a waste of time. And, um, sh and then the last thing is uh, carry a bar fag wherever I go for the next month. So I really appreciate it. And, uh, <laughs> Carry a what? A barf bag. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. I so, mean, um, thank you. That's, I mean, that's, a, that's excellent. And the, um, we haven't gotten into, in, when we, in the longer seminars, uh, what I do is I, I, I make control freaks uh, uh, give a commitment to kind of clean out all the, the, the 7,000 things that you've got, dump them in a trash can, just in a big doggy bag, go through all the mail, all the junk, that you've kept for all your life that doesn't mean anything, all the old clothes that you're never going to wear, you're never going to fit into again. I mean, but I mean, she, and that's one of the things that we do. In fact, uh, the, um, that, I told you that the kid got it right away. I mean, when she sat right up here, I knew it I, instantly, you know. It's like the hot man or the hot woman. I mean, she, she got it. She's got less preconditioning to fight with fight over. To, she's got less garbage in to, uh, to get rid of. But it's still not easy. I mean, she, she saw she was stuttering when she was saying it. Okay, and, nauseous right now. Yeah, yeah. The barf bag she's going to get. I believe her. So, Karen, good job. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that is the ultimate. And it, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, six months from now, a year from now, a year and a half from now, that I'm going to be able to get her on the phone like I did uh, Casey or have her at one of these deals like Burl. And uh, she's going to have made uh, quantum leaps in her, in her career, whatever she decides to do. The idea about not wasting her time selling the business, I, I, I would agree. You know, it's like I tell some of these guys, just turn the key, walk away. It's like I gave away 10 years of equity. Remember the building I gave back into the bank? 10 years of real estate equity that I rolled up in uh, um, tax-free exchanges and all that crap. All the time I wasted on that damn bill, it just pisses me off. <laughs> and I had a partner named Chris Popovich, he used to play basketball, six foot ten or whatever. And uh, he went, I knew we were in trouble when he says, I'm going to give you my half. <laughs> yeah. And so he says, Dan, I can't screw with anyone. I can't manage. Well, how am I going to manage it from Scotland? And, and I ultimately gave it back to the bank, you know, and we had a lot of equity in it. I just said, this is it. Forget it. Because I'm spending so much time fiddle farting around with this b big, huge building, then I, I'm losing money. This is costing me money and all the other things I do. And I gave it back. I just, I didn't bother, didn't sell it, didn't do anything, just gave it to them. And they sent me a check for $13,000. I still remember this. And I could never, I couldn't figure out why. And it's because <clears throat> I had, my lawyer had agreed that I would pay part of closing costs when they transferred. I first sent for, anyway, and at the end, because there was so much equity left in the building, they sent me the 13 grand back. They couldn't even take it from me. The bank didn't have the, the, the balls to take my money, so they just sent me back the $13,000. But, I mean, I just walked away. I just walked away. And, I mean, I, you know, for this room, I had, uh, you'd consider it a good net worth, let alone just equity in a building, or a series of buildings, and but sometimes that's what you got to do. Just walk away. So I relate to what she just said. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. One more thing. On the subject of what she said, it might be a good marketing tip for you to create some quantum leaf barf bags to give out quantum at the end Quantum leaf barf that. bags. Yeah, that, that is. That's a... Whoops. Okay. We're going we're gonna to come to a crescendo now, and it's going to be rapid. Exit strategy, most of you, your exit strategy will be dropping dead. Hoffman's going to drop dead at one of his stores, just curl over behind the register, you know, checking to make sure nobody stole any dollar bills. And, <laughs> and, that, and that's, that's, not, that's not what quantum leap growth is all about. You know, and, and I'm not saying it's three years, five years, or ten years, because I already told you, if you're over 40 years old, in, your, in the next cycle, blow your business out. I don't care where, just blow it out. Because you may not live long enough to see the second cycle. And, I, and I'm a proponent of selling things in up markets, not down markets. Just blow it out. Whether you're ready to retire or not, just blow it out. And Mosby's, if that happens, when it happens, to us in Fire Resources, remind me of this. Don't let me hang on. And, and don't let Grubbs and Harris try to convince the hang on. Blow it out. Just blow it out. Expecting the unexpected and planning, trying to plan an exit strategy around all the alternatives that could possibly or all the permutation is impossible. Desert storm, hurricanes, you name it. You're going to move up here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. And all, and all the other junk that can happen to you. I mean, floods. Um, but don't ever underestimate how wrong you can be. Don't plan for it, but don't underestimate it. So then when it happens, it doesn't take you a year or four years to overcome it, to, you know, to, to dig yourself out of the emotional hole. Remember that you've got two checkbooks. You've got an emotional checkbook and you've got a, a financial checkbook. Most people's growth is prohibited by the emotional checkbook. Everybody in this room thinks they need more capital to grow. What you need is a deeper emotional checkbook. You need more money in your emotional bank account, not in your financial one. Keeping your laser beam focused, focused to the point of exclusion of everything else. I used to use a slide, the exclusion of God, country, and family, and not necessarily in that order. 
But because I'm a kinder, gentler guy, I don't use that slide anymore. I just tell you. Do the ends justify the means? You damn right they do. And anybody that tells you any different hasn't been there. The ends do justify the means. As long as it's legal, moral, and ethical, I will tell you that your moralities and ethics will change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you don't think that, you little bit, I got a, I got a, I got a bridge I need to sell you. I mean, <clears throat> And why does a racehorse wear blinders? To stay focused. Most of you ought to sell blinders. Make a note of this. We're going to have quantum leap blinders for these people next time we do this. Barf bag and blinders. Going to give them a, a quantum leap special deal. And of course, they don't want to give it away to make it a special, see? Make it a special bonus. <clears throat> the most important decision you'll make since starting your business is getting out. And very, very, other than the insurance industry that covers it too well, I don't know of any industry that covers exit strategies. And they're trying to sell you $4 billion worth of whole life, unless this business has changed since I used to do it. I mean, they've got all kind of fancy products, but it's basically whole life. And somehow whole life seems to be better, right, Craig? Okay, it hasn't changed since I did it. Yeah. These people writing quick, huh? We gotta put a book of all the overhead and sell that. You know? Tom did that. Yeah. I know he did. Well, pay yourself first. This is my favorite slide. Because this is the thing I believe in the most. This is where my heart's in a hundred percent. Most of you that are living off of your businesses that aren't public, are squeezing it and, 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 and paying for your water bill at your house and just squeezing it to death and trying to ride the profits on so you can live off the company. Okay, I understand that. I don't agree with it because then when you try to sell it, then I told you already, well, if you back all these numbers that I stole over the last 25 years, the company's really made a lot of money. Well, nobody does that. <clears throat> But what you should do, and is mandatory, is as you grow, continue to pay yourself out of profits. Don't keep plowing them back in. Because then, one, if you never get to that cycle to sell, at least you've gotten a lot of money out of the business in the meantime. And two, and more importantly, when it's time to sell, you don't have to squeeze the last damn dollar out of the business because you're already rich. I've seen more entrepreneurs businessmen that run companies that have had to walk away or not get what they wanted out of their companies because they were asking for too much. They were trying to stretch. But if you paid yourself all the way up, you don't have to do that. Big, big point. Even after I got thrown out of Great Western, as the, as the uh, jurors saw, to, uh, horrified as they were, Dan Pena paid, pulled out $26 million between 1985 and 1991 to pay himself. I pulled it out though. Damn right I did. What if I hadn't have pulled it out? Then I'd get thrown out of my ass. Then I'd really be sick. <laughs> I'd have to use that barf bag. <clears throat> I paid myself, and I paid everybody else. I paid myself down to the guy that drove me in my car. How did you pay yourself? Bonus or? Bonus, salary increases, whatever I could think of. Or not actually whatever, old Melbourne and Myers, and we hired some other doofus big time compensation company, so it was all pretty and nice and legal. They used to have to remind me well, you, uh, uh, this month you're supposed to give yourself a $60,000 raise. And I forget. Well, I, mean, I didn't keep track of that stuff. I, well, what are you here for? Controller? Pay it to be retroactive. Do you want interest? Nah, nah, you don't have to give me interest. Do you? <laughs> you don't have to give me interest, you know. I'm a sport. You don't have to give me interest. Yeah. Well, can I take the interest then? You pay me in the interest. Pay yourself first. It gets you out of a lot of problems. It also makes it more readily or more easier for you to get used to 
hunting with the big dogs. Because if you're plowing all your money like a skin flint back in the company, you got no money to hunt with the big dogs. You got no money to go around the world for four, five, six weeks playing golf with your good friend, like I'm going to do here in a few weeks. You got no money because it's all back in the company. And if you do go public and they throw your ass out because you're worthless and you've hit your Peter principle 15 years ago, by the way, a lot of people don't go public because they know in their hearts they are worthless. They know the first time, if, if they can get a quality board together, which ain't likely, normally Merle Lynch will do it for you, and one of the caveats, and they tell all the board members, if the investment house puts the board together for you, it's, I'll guarantee it, within 12 months you're gone. We gotta keep him on because his name's on them stores, but as soon as that, he's in history. <laughs> we'll throw his miserable ass out quicker than Johnny got out of the army. So I'd put my own board together if I was you. <clears throat> Craig, they'll offer to put your board for you. And if I'm on that board, Hoffman, <clears throat> I've got to look out for the shareholders. <laughs> because Omar Khayyam said it better than I, some for the glories of this world and some sigh for the prophet's paradise to come. I'll take the cash and let the promise go, nor heed the music of the distant drummer. How many was that, two, four thousand years ago? When was that? Long time ago. Long time ago. And they knew it even then. Take the cash and run like a thief in the night. <laughs> <clears throat> I keep telling you, this stuff isn't new. Since, since before Christ, since Cro-Magnum man crawled, by the way, Steve Sussman, God love him, one of my top lawyers, he looks like Cro-Magnum, man, he looks like a throwback. Since Steve Sussman crawled over that big slimy rock. Okay, now, you didn't think it was over, did you? You didn't get off that easy. You can think positively all day long, all year long, but positive action is what counts. We talked about a lot of you said that you've already been doing what it takes, but you've got low expectations. Otherwise, you'd already be where you want to be. Trying harder and harder starts producing less and less. I think some of the, you in the audience have already uh, uh, been exposed to that. It's not about trying harder and harder. It's not trying, like, I'll do my best. It's I'll do what is necessary, as Winston Churchill said. I'll do what's necessary. Your doubts are not the product of accurate thinking, but habitual thinking. That crappy preconditioning that your parents gave you, and your school teachers gave you, and all your doofus friends gave you. It's habitual thinking. Because remember, just because you've never seen it, absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence. <clears throat> I want you to get out there and get ruthless. Now, this young lady, she's getting about as ruthless as she can for where she is in life. Get out there and get ruthless. I want you to be like, like the last two minutes of your last Super Bowl. Now, just a quick brief summary on how we get started, how are we going to go out and do this. We got a dream. You've got to have the human resources. You've got to put a dream team together. For some of you, that's a board. For some of you, that's a mentor. I already told you what I think of mastermind groups. I don't think much of them. Although some people do make them work, I hum I've never been part of one that was worth a damn. Because I told you they suck all my brains. And, I'm, you know, and I, I'm, I'm the one limp leaving the room and everybody else is all charged up. <clears throat> and you've got perception equals reality, and I call it the root success. You want to act more successful, you've only got one time to make a first impression. I didn't come to this seminar the day, first day with this sweatshirt on. I came the last day, because your perception of me has already been built. And it's way greater than you ever think, you, you can even imagine. My grandiose 
lifestyle and how and what I've done. It's bigger than life, and that's the way I like it. it almost cost me my 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 financial net worth in, in trial, but we got over that, and we're going to talk about that in a second. You got to take action now. You've got to step up to the plate. You're going to develop your quantum leap battle plan. You've gotten the forms and you only need a marginal shift. I already told you the difference between a 250 batter and a 350 batter is the difference between making three or four or five hundred thousand dollars a year and making five, six, eight million dollars a year. One time at bat, 10% better. That's it. There's not a man, woman, or child, and to some of you younger ladies, you're just children to me, that can't make a 10% additional effort. None. <clears throat> We've been, you've been given the 11 step idea to uh, execution, and now we, we want you to apply for those seminars that are worth going to. We want you, now you can go back and apply the, some of the good things that you have learned at those other seminars and through those other tapes and through those other um, uh, books. You've been given the, the foundation, the tools to pick and choose what really works. And I, I've tried to stress, even though I'm at the uh, General Patton or the Schwarzkopf end of the continuum, you can be a Henry Kissinger type and still get it done very, very effectively. There's no question about that. There's too many guys out there that have been successful at it. And you don't have to do it alone, and more importantly, you can't do it alone. Forget about, you, you don't have to do it alone. In my judgment, you can't do it alone. In my judgment, you need a mentor. We've talked about who, where, how, when. Talked about Jerry Buss answering these guys' phone calls. He had nobody called him in 25, how long has he been here in Los Angeles, Jerry Buss? 25 years? Nobody's called him since he's been here. Can you believe that? started off at, uh, with houses in Compton and Watts. Okay. Well, I mean, since he bought the Lakers, since he got to be a high-profile high guy, nobody's ever called him. <sighs> How do you ask for help? One form is being here. One form is, is asking a mentor. Don't find time. Make it. Just do it. And again, like the last two minutes of your Super Bowl, your last Super Bowl, Each person is able to realize your dream. Concluding remarks, you know what my background is. It wasn't too stellar to say that I'm being kind when I say that. Uh, I got my act together. It's no panacea. And, and this is your wake-up call. This is your wake-up call, ladies and gentlemen. Now, this was... Could we turn the lights down a little? You put in your mind what your dream is this was mine living in a castle with all the overhead and all the expenses isn't everybody's cup of tea it happens to be mine and it happens to be my wife's and it's my kids don't know any different don't know any better but whatever yours is you should constantly eat it sleep it Breathe it for every day of your life from now till they put dirt on you and daisies are growing up from your chest and maggots are eating your eyes out. That, uh, that's pretty graphic. That's, that's brutal. Yeah, that's pretty graphic. That's but I mean, I showed you the castle timeline goal deal from uh, April of 83 to August of not 84. It all happened. It all happened. It can happen for you as quickly. This was my perception of myself way before I was like this. You have to, in your own mind, have the perception of what you want to be, and then people's perception of you will follow. People perceive me as being bigger than life. But I am. And they will perceive you to be whatever you perceive yourself to be. The people we call gifted are different from the crowd in one very special way. They accepted their gifts. They let them happen. The high achievers, the persons you admire, 
are those individuals who opened their gifts. These winners have more gifts because they claimed them, took them out of the wrappings and used them. I've merely opened them up. You haven't opened a lot of them yet. We've all got the same gifts under the tree. We've already proven we're all about 100 IQ from the first day. Now that I've known you a little better, I have to, I, I'd say that we probably gave most of the people in the room a little and as opposed to taking any away from them. But uh, that's, a, you know, hindsight's 2020. The path that is your destiny is yours. This was written to me 36 years ago, or 30, uh, 57, 50, 50, 50, 36 or 37 years ago. It's the only good advice my dad's ever given me. It's the only advice he ever gave me, probably. To my son, this was when I graduated from grammar school. Approach it, uh, the future is yours. Approach it on, with honesty and ambitiously, with a will to fight for the rights of mankind. I'm always in litigation because I don't like being screwed around and I don't like other people being screwed around. That's one of the reasons I litigate a lot. And it's a cleansing process. It separates the men from the boys. All high performance people litigate a lot. Always balance the rights of man with the rights of society. Have faith in yourself and faith in people. Have faith in yourself. That's what self-esteem is all about. Have faith in people. Give them the opportunity. Give them the equity. Allow them to make mistakes and help them grow. For if you trust no one, you cannot trust yourself. If you don't allow people you get paid for what you do and what you get other people to do for you. If, you. if you are not effective getting people to help you, not beyond your, beyond your dream team, you will not be able to create quantum growth in anything that you do. You've got to incorporate the use of other people. You can't do it by yourself, and I'm not just talking about a mentor. You've got to create a team that works for you, that transcends the, 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 the few people that you can organize and, and supervise properly. Now, I've told you I know there's life after death because I've been dead five times. I've come back from death, so I've seen that tunnel, but every time I see the tunnel, it's a dollar sign at the end. I don't see God down there. I see my dollar sign. Maybe someday I'll see him at that end of the tunnel. Hopefully not anytime soon. But it's important that even when you get these high-priced advisors and you believe in them, you get the best money, uh, the best you can't afford, they make mistakes. And this is when the ultimate suck up your pantyhose time. Now this is a letter that was written to me March 19, 1993 by the law firm of Sussman and Godfrey, the highest paid plaintiff lawyer in America today, Steve Sussman. And it says here basically, you were not as pessimistic as Skip. However, you stated that you would not proceed at trial if Steve and I thought you only had a 1% chance of winning, but uh, that you were inclined to go forward if I uh, had a significant chance of winning, even if it was less than 50%. I write to address that issue. To make a long story short, he tells me I can't win. I can't win. This is in March before the trial. This is the end of the letter, and it says, very true to yours, that I will defend you till you run out of money, basically. <laughs> then on September 11th, this was um, three weeks into the trial. As I indicated this, uh, as I dictate this, we are at the end of the fourth week of the trial in your case. I want to once again urge you to consider settlement. Although you have rejected all previous settlement in, uh, entreaties by Great Western, we have now completed. Blah, 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 blah. He goes on to say that uh, you got no chance of winning, and you've had your say in court. They thought I just wanted to get up and flap my mouth. No, uh, they wanted me to settle because they honestly felt that we didn't have any chance. They had. Uh, they. I was being. Uh, accused of 32 uh, counts uh, of wrongdoing, 
that I had, uh, they were suing me for something in excess of $200 million. Uh, if I had lost, it would have wiped, you know, pretty much wiped me out. Um, and they said all the evidence, you know, they, 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 uh, they had 30 or 40 witnesses that all came up and perjured themselves. All that dream team that they're going to bring in to be your board of directors, Craig, all perjured themselves, will all perjure themselves when it comes between you and their ass. Cameron, everybody. And uh, I, we had one witness, me. What were they offering to settle for? Nothing. They said, you pay us a million dollars and go away and we won't put you in jail. What a deal. What a bargain. Yeah. Yeah, what a deal. So even when you get the very best that money can buy, which they were, they're not always right. And conventional wisdom was I was going up the river. Of course, after I won, which isn't true, I don't plan, plan to come back to the England. This is an English paper. I don't plan to come back. But, you know, it sounds better that I did plan to come back. Life is like riding a bicycle. You don't fall off unless you stop pedaling. And that's Claude Pepper, God bless him. He was in Congress and in the Senate and governor of the state of Florida for 60 or 70 years. He had the best looking 30 year old administrative assistant I ever saw in my life. And I mean, Claude used to, his head flopped over, drooling on her big breast, sit there. Is it time for you and me to vote? God bless him. He's gone now, old Claude. Now, we have covered a lot of material, and you have, we have talked about concepts that are very much foreign to you in many, many ways, especially the expectations and the self-esteem things. For those of you, the uh, ex-alter boys. Nemo potest extrem patrium. I, will, and I didn't used to have a uh, translation underneath, but then nobody remembered their Latin very well, so I put a translation underneath. Um, perhaps I can help you beyond today, yesterday, and the day before. I've talked to a lot of you. We've got ongoing dialogues and discussions, and we're going to continue those dialogues. Um, but the most important thing to me is that whether you continue to talk to me or you don't continue to talk to me, is that you put these things into application for your own self, for your family. Again, when you lose focus, you not only let yourself down, your business down, but you let your family down. And I don't think any of you want to do that. Um, I'm open to questions um, on anything that we've covered, on anything other than politics, because I don't give a damn about politics. I don't know about 187 or anything else. So, um, Ed, do you have something? The mic? Yeah. What's happened to Great Western since you've left? Um, well, I helped him. Um, I've, I've, I, I'm, I talk to them, I give them help, I'm, I'm still the largest shareholder, individual shareholder, so um, the, uh, I help them get them into um, South America, they're in the process, they're doing fine, I mean, they're doing well, the stock price is way down, not so much because of me, I don't think, maybe it is, but because of, uh, you know, the Iraqi war and all the things that uh, they had to deal with. I think uh, partially they cut the dividend out when I uh, got thrown out because I got most of the dividend and so they decided and they didn't understand when they cut the dividend all the in income funds that owned them sold the stock and the stock dropped 60 70 percent but just so I wouldn't get the dividend they cut they did away with the dividend short-term solution to long-term problems but they thought that they could tie up my money and I wouldn't have money to fight the defense and so that's why they cut the dividend now so now they may, they, if they instill the dividend, none of the institutions that believe them, they're going to keep it around. Whenever they get in trouble, they'll just cut it again. So we were a trustee stock. We were a um, widows and orphan stock. 
And so, but you know, there's, I don't worry about that. I could use the f several million dollars you used to get dividends, but you know, that's life. The company's doing well though. They're doing very well. Earlier today, you said that when your um, father is asked about you, he just considers you an enigma and says, I don't, I don't know, I can't explain Dan, we, the family just kind of, uh, but then it was kind of, it was eerie because when having that in mind, when you put up that slide about that quote from your father, mm -hmm. uh, way back when, when you were graduating from grammar school and you started to realize what I've heard for three days and, pl and apply it to what your father had given you maybe not even aware of all that he'd given you back then, everything, giving well, away equity, I mean, everything. Well, I mean, he didn't give, he, he wrote that in my little book, and I used to use that signature to forge my uh, passes at the, the Miss School. <laughs> it's, the, the book is all worn out, where there's Manuel Pena, because I used to use tracing paper and I used to forge it, and my senior year in high school, I missed 187 days of school. There's not many more than 187 days, but I mean, so I, I mean, wonder, I wonder maybe if he, he did. I, don't, I didn't realize you know, I picked up on this uh, when, you know, 15 years ago when I was given the uh, Latin Business Association Award as uh, Businessman of the Year. I was going through, I was trying to think of a, uh, a keynote speech I was, was going to make and, and because, uh, you know, the Latins like the familia bullshit. And so I was trying to say, what can I say positive about my, my family? And I couldn't think of anything, you know, he whacked the shit out of me, broke my ribs, you know, ripped my arm out of it. So, I mean, uh, that's not, not what they want to hear too much. My question was whether he ever makes the connection. Oh! No, 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 I'm sorry. No, not at all. Mm -mm. I said this at a speech, and my wife will attest to this. Remember how he sobbed? He started sobbing. I, in the, in the, I used this in the middle of the speech, and you couldn't hear. I mean, there was like 2,500 people at the Biltmore Hotel, and you could hear this old man. Sherrod, you were there. Where Sherrod Sher left? He was just sobbing because he knew he had nothing to do with it. And Dan's in that, he had the guilt, he had the Jewish guilt. <laughs> he felt like shit, because basically treated me like shit all my, most of my life. But it, it, good boy, all the, all the Mexicans out there crying. Damn, it was great. I, I really worked though. I'm a great, I can give a great speech. There's no question about that. But it worked, I mean, and he just felt bad because here, you know, uh, he knows. Now he, I think he, when he wrote that, 1957 his intentions were right and what he would say if he were here today he'd say i did the best i could i know that i did wrong but i thought i was doing right and you know that's what he'd say he's told me that you know but he tells my kids that i was an honor student that i was this i was that and that i never had to hit dan because he was always such a good boy <laughs> and so i uh, dan and derek come down to my office just a couple years ago and they tell me this i said this is that's bullshit kids that's not true we're going to go down and talk to grandpa get it straightened out so we went down into the, the den, and he's sitting there drinking, watching the TV, and, you know, uh, and I said, Dad, we need to talk to you about this. And um, the boys just came up and told me that you said I was an honor student, and I said I was anything but that. And I said, you never hit me, and, and, and the kids want to know if that's true. And, and I said, I want you to tell them. Like this. He never looked up. No, it's not true. He feels the passion that I do about how wrong he was now. But, you know, you can't waste time on things you can't change, you know. We're not very close, and we haven't been, probably never will be. But the, um, it's, it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's part of the thing that's probably made me what, what I am today is because I've gone out of my way to be successful. You know, my family, if I, just to keep me alive was their goal until the age of reason. That's the only, not get out of high school, not get good grades, just if we can keep them alive. <laughs> and I tested that on many occasions, you know, and the, um, but it, it, it makes, it, you know, and, and um, it, it makes the resolve, and we, you know, we all have our stories about our life. But I mean, I, I didn't get any of this uh, this feeling of being successful till I was in my 20s. 
and I really made a resolve when I was in my early 30s. I got a late start. I mean, some of you say you're older than that now, but I mean, it's never too late. I didn't get, I didn't really get my act together until I was in my early 30s. Shit, and I'm in my late 40s now, so I've only been doing this 15 years, really. Uh, but I'm, you know, one thing that, that dif differentiates me from almost everybody I know, I'm a quick learner. When I figure out something that works, I don't go back and reinvent the wheel over nothing. I am a quick learner, boy. I mean, when somebody, when I learned something about the energy business from G Jerry Ormond or Grazos, or I mean, that's it. It's in concrete. I don't need to. I don't. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. That's why working with women. When I work with women, it's easier because they don't reinvent the wheel. When I tell them, you know, Burl, I think to make your next 20 million, what you got to do is you got to let a, a cab kind of crease you over here, hit you kind of in the side. She, Burl says, do you want me to hit him from the back? Hit the cab, hit me from the back? Do I have to expose my, you know? She wouldn't ask. <laughs> Whereas some of the men, well, you know, gee, I could get hurt there. What if the guy doesn't hit the brakes in time and I could get a broken rib and, gee... Some of this stuff uh, is almost blind faith. Let the force be with you, you know, like in that movie. It's like Obi-Wan Kenobi. You know, maybe I'm your Obi-Wan Kenobi. For some of you, I'm going to be Obi-Wan Kenobi. Obi-Wan, for some of you. For some of you, you'll put your tapes away and never listen to them or give them to somebody. For some of your notes, for some of you, that's life. I've... When I first started doing this, you know, I, 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 uh, my ego was involved that I couldn't understand how come I can't change everybody's life. But I, I understand that's not possible. But what I would submit to you, if you just change a little bit, you're going to be better off in your business. You're going to leave more to your family. I mean, and, um, and that makes me feel good. I've already, I'm only doing this 15, 18 months, I've already had a lot, a lot of success with a lot of people. So now what we have to do is get me in front of more people, and that's what we're working on. You know, it's, it's, it's taken us 15 months of doofusing around to figure out what the formula was. This seminar has sold for as much as 10 grand and as little as $119, testing the market. That's a big dichotomy. That's a big spread. And the 10 grand people think they got a bargain. And some of the $119 people bitched. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not lying to you, you know. And what, you know, I want to, want to, you know, crush their heads. But I mean, you know, there's, a, you know, we've been told, and we're, and we're still continuing to test marketing. And you know, I'm trying to get a book written. Um, I am going to get a book written, but I got, I'm, I'm working on getting the right ghostwriter. And um, there's all kinds of. I didn't even need a product for the first year in one month. I had nothing to sell. Didn't have a tape. Didn't have a book. Didn't have squat. And then, you know, and then um, Ed kind of fell upon me like, like the clap. And, you know, and the, um, I was going to be more graphic and say, are we still on the camera? Oh, yeah, oh, never mind. Okay. And so, um, and he's helped me a great deal in, in defining where I should be. And, but um, I think it's suffice it to say, I think this audience is, 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 is good proof. And you have uh, critique forms, don't they? I don't want any doofus critiques. I didn't get my question answered it's because you didn't ask. So don't just, if you're going to put that down, just don't bother filling anything out. <laughs> and because um, I'm here, I'll answer them still. Um, but uh, the, uh, it's, so it's been a learning process. I tell the biggest marketing mistake I ever made, and I, people have heard me, I sent out 65,000 brochures, $8 brochures, with no phone number or address how to contact me. <laughs> true story. I said that at the Abraham. It's a, it's a true story. And I remember one of the guys at the Abraham says, I've got one of those fancy brochures. What were you trying to do? And, and, but it's true. You know, I've done, you know, fortunately I had money. Otherwise I'd be out of this business already. But the, uh, I made all those mistakes because when I got into this business, I didn't really understand it was a business. I just thought I'd have an open forum to flap my mouth about stuff that I believed in. And it is a business, and so we're running it more like a business now. Or we are running it like a business now, not more like a business. But uh, the name of the game is, um, uh, is exposure, and that's what 95 is all about, is, is exposing these, bless you, exposing these precepts, these concepts to as many people as we can, as fast as we possibly can. And um, because I'm not sure, 
I'm, I plan on doing this the next few years. Uh, I'm not sure I'll do it forever, um, but at least for the next few years until my kids, you know, um, probably get out of school when my kids are young. Yes, a question in the back. Dan, on the first morning, you, you said that there were four to five major points to remember, things along the lines of uh, all high-performance people are have a good high level of uh, love for themselves, uh, focus on only two to three things at once. Uh, the third point, by empowering people to duplicate your energy, uh, you will affect the greater presence and results. Number four was act as if there were no limits to your abilities. Is there a fifth or sixth yeah, point you'd add yeah. to that? Yeah, you asked me that before. Now, I uh, all high performance people give away parts of their deals. All, they all do in different forms, but they all give away. Um, and um, all high performance individuals never look back they only look forward they they're not interested in what they did you know there's a, you know a lot of the kkr guys and these guys have done so many billions of dollars in deals they don't look back they're only looking at what they can do going forward and so um those are all common traits of um, high performance people high performance people also don't even think about pay price to action. The only reason I've articulated it like that is because I'm doing this now. They just do what it takes. Winston Churchill says, don't do your best, do what it, you know, do what it takes. And they just naturally do that. Joe Montana doesn't think about pay price to action. He's going to get a less salary and this. He just throws, does whatever it takes. Takes him down the field. They got two seconds or two minutes. Takes him down the field. That's it. And uh, the uh, and when I make the analogy, uh, playing the last two minutes of, of your Super Bowl, it's it's uh, they just they, they don't even think about it's ingrained because remember motivation gets you started, a habit keeps you going, and these people are in the habit of winning. I'm in the habit of winning. I mean, I'm dumbfounded when the financial institution turns me down. I'm dumbfounded when something I do doesn't work. You know, uh, Mike here, please. Uh, earlier, when you were talking about uh, delegating or giving your uh, critical path to your your subordinates or your team or whatever it is, and you talked about that the after the, naturally they're going to make mistakes. By definition, it, it's, it's a certainty. Um, and my question is, if you have a, an individual or individuals that, um, and I, I've made a lot of mistakes myself, and one of the things that I think I do well is I am, I am also a quick learner. I usually only make a, a particular mistake once. But sometimes I have some people who make the same mistake, you know, the same mistake two, three, four, five times. Those are people or history. That's about what I thought yeah. because I. Yeah. 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 We want to memorialize this for time with. eternal. We had that discussion at breakfast this morning with the one of the crew that is here, and it could be that uh, if he's making the same mistake over and over, it's because he knows that you're going to correct the mistake. That's another. That's a good point. Yep. That is the best answer. Oh, thank you. Good point. Can you go over how you get uh, your attorney and accountants into the deal step by step? Using stealth and canny. Um, well, the lure of greed of money. Yeah, the big, big promise. And yeah, I mean, uh, because especially now, the accounting business and the lawyer business is extremely competitive, big time. I mean, uh, these guys would do almost anything for, for, for business. And what you do is when, when I find... Um, uh, an attorney or a lawyer or a financial person that I want to bring into my deal, I first of all start by giving them all my business, or at least all the business that makes sense. You know, if I'm fighting a, a lawsuit in Houston and I got a New York lawyer, I mean, I, but I mean all the business that makes sense. And um, I, um, I, I bring him in and start to talk to him about giving him a piece of the deal 
And I'm, I'm meaning it, though. I'm not just jerking them around, I'm giving them a piece of the deal. Um, and normally over three or six or nine months, um, because it normally takes a guy that long, if he's got any clientele whatsoever, to phase himself out of certain cases. Because unlike just closing down a door, as any a lawyer will get disbarred and sued for a malpractice, he can't just walk out the door. If clients have any brains, and maybe clients don't have any brains anymore, you sue them for malpractice. You can't just leave. So you, you phase them in. That's one of the only things that I believe, believe that is it's a smart way to phase them in and tell them, okay, you're the lawyer. We're doing business. A year from now, you're going to join the firm of ABC, and you're going to own 10% of the company. And, and two things happen. Number one, he becomes more dedicated to your, your needs. Number two, he allows him to phase out. And, and, and number three, it allows him in, in, in a proper way to re-dictate or how he, the billable hours are, are, are doing. Now, some of the big, huge firms will not take contingency cases. Some of the big, huge firms have an absolute policy of not taking equity in deals. O'Melveny and Myers is one of them. I mean, O'Melveny and Myers will not take a contingency or, uh, or a, an, an equity position ever. But I don't use O'Melveny for that. Whereas Sussman and Godfrey, which is the, one of the finest litigating firms in the country, will. They'll take equity. In fact, I was going to get the penthouse in London as part of a settlement with Great Western. They were going to take 40% of the penthouse. This is when we were negotiating a, a, a possible contingency. As it turned out, I just paid them the money and I didn't do a contingency fee. But they were going to take 40%. 40, you know, the, the two senior partners said, okay, well, as long as we can use it when we're in London, that's part of the fee. And well, originally, I mean, the, the junior partners of the law firm told me that was impossible. But when Steve Sussman likes London, Neil Manny likes London, their, their doofus wives like, this is, we got to put a nice big three-story, six-bedroom penthouse, that'd be great. Now, you, you can't give them a, a, a fishing house on a lake in Waco, Texas. <laughs> they'd be less interested. <laughs> I mean, they, in fact, I don't think they'd be, but maybe a partner in a fairly big regional firm in Waco, Texas would be interested. And, I, and I'm sure, but you can. It's, uh, for any firms that's got like 10 to 100 lawyers in it, you'll be able to to bring them into deals. 10 to 100 lawyers off the top of my head. Accounting firms, some regional, well, count by, by gap rules can't take equity in deals, accountants can't take, because then their uh, opinions are, are not tarnished, whatever, invalid. Who can't? Accountants can't equity, they're not supposed to take equity but in deals. Do. I know, but see, those aren't the big six accounting firms, and their, their numbers are by definition, by gap, general accounting procedures, shouldn't be accepted if the other side knew that they had equity in the deal by definition uh, the numbers are invalid see but see like business you know, a lot of business brokers aren't honest they take fees on both sides of deals I mean doesn't mean just because the rules say that they're supposed to do that doesn't mean they adhere to them so over time and after experience dealing with various accountants and lawyers you find the two or three that you think that you could live long term with and then you approach them on on a, a business basis that I want you to come in as my in-house general counsel or chief operating officer, or chief financial officer, or whatever. whatever. Most medium-sized business have, are poorly represented in the chief financial officer area. And companies zero to $50 million, and I'm talking about revenue now, are normally always poorly represented. I mean, they don't have any experience, and, uh, and that's why they have poor banking relations. They don't have adequate lines of credit. Uh, they're not if they if they are factoring receivables they're factoring them in a, in a piss poor way and um, the because they got some guy and uh, there was internal who was the bookkeeper that they rose uh, or pushed up the line and put her, pr promoted him way beyond his level of expertise you know the famous Peter principle why, why did you decide to get into oil? You were just looking for a deal, and no, no, I was on. I was with a Wall Street firm, of Bear Stearns. I saw the first oil embargo in 1973, and when the 79 oil embargo hit, I saw a lot of idiots become instantly worth 20, 50, 100 million dollars. Oil went from two dollars and forty cents a barrel to fourteen dollars a barrel. I mean, it was obvious to me that this was an industry I had to be in. Uh, it, in my judgment, the large oil companies were, the, were at that time the, the, the most poorly 
manage companies uh, in, uh, in commerce in America. And uh, they just, I mean, Jerry can tell better stories than I can, but I mean, there were fortunes made on the, the mistakes of major oil companies. I mean, and so I thought that there was chaos. I didn't know anything about the oil business. I had one oil client, one whole big oil client. That was it, that's enough for me. J.R. Ewing was always my hero. Yep. Well, they used to call me the JR of London. Uh, there's a lot of newspaper articles that referred to me as a JR, and they didn't do it in the in the negative sense that because they I was doing things that were uh, disreputable. They did it because the guy always made it happen. JR always. You never think JR never failed, did he? Mm -hmm. And I that was a JR of London boy, and uh, the um, and I did for for um, you know for, for a lot of years. I mean, everything I touched turned to gold. I mean for a lot of years, for ten, almost 10 straight, 10 years. So oil, it's down now, right? It's at the low end of its? No, it's, it's way back, it's up again, it's up about 40%. Yeah, uh, there's not as much chaos in the energy industry as there once was. Now there's chaos in different countries in the energy industry. South America, there's a lot of chaos. Russia, China, there's a lot of chaos. But I'm not interested, I wanna do something I wanna do, do something different, I'm not interested in doing something. I already know I know how to build an energy company. I know how to do that. I know how to build any company, so I want to do something different. And so that's why I've had many opportunities to get back in the energy business, but I'm not interested. I'm just not. Um, the, I can make as much money, if not more. Plus, to the extent that I help Great Western prosper, you know, I still have all those many, many, many millions of shares of the stock that I, you know, I can, I can help direct its destiny, because I talk to the, news, the CEO all the time. Uh, and uh, give him some, give him guidance. And so, at least so far, he's listening. We'll see what happens. Was he one of your, one of your team? No, he was one of the team that tried to cut my head off. He was always trying to cut my head off, and I was always successful in battering him down. He had he, he, a couple of the board meetings. He called for boardroom um, votes, but I was, you know, I always battered him down. But then the Kuwaitis brought in a chairman who was slicker than him. It wasn't, I don't know if he was slicker than me. I don't know if you could say Howard was slicker than me, but he ultimately replaced me. Because when, when a company that owns 40% of the company and a public company decides it's time for you to go, it's time for you to go. There's no choice. You have no choice. And they would, but they didn't want to pay me. After I left, two weeks later, they said, well, we decided we're not going to give you that big golden parachute that we owe you. And I slapped the suit on him immediately. And the other thing about suits, you know these people that write letters, well, if we don't hear from you in two weeks, we're going to... You slap their ass with a suit instantly. You don't screw around. Just like we did to that doofus piece of shit just recently. You, I mean, because you know how many people get letters from lawyers that we're going to sue you and they don't get sued? I kick them right where it hurts instantly. You don't get a letter, we're going to sue you from me. You get a lawsuit. And then, well, oh, we didn't mean that. And, uh, and then, 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 you, then you, and the plaintiff always has the best run, by the way. It's always better to sue than be sued. The reason the plaintiff in a jury trial gets two cracks at the jury. The plaintiff gets up and has their closing arguments, then the doofus defense gets up and does it, and the plaintiff gets up again. You got two cracks. And if you got a lawyer that's worth his salt, in fact, I was going to give the closing arguments in my big trial, then the judge told me I couldn't. He was, she wasn't sure it was in the Constitution or something, or it's the Texas or something crap. I was going to give my own closing arguments. I'm as good as my lawyers, not better. So you always sue. Don't wait. So if somebody sends you a letter, say, whack them. You them over the head. Yeah, you just whack it to them right quick. Because, I mean, plaintiff has always got the advantage. It's got the advantage in filing and all the other junk. Yeah, venue, I mean, that's exactly right. Venue, I mean, that's right. I mean, um, because to me, litigation is a business tool. That's all it is. It's a business tool to make people honor contracts. Because I, you know, I, well, I tell people right up front, I'm, I'll, I'll sue you quicker than you, you know, you, you went to potty this morning when you got out of bed. I mean, if you don't honor your contract with me, I don't like to, you know, I don't like to get jerked around. I sued, I spent a couple, three hundred thousand dollars on a lawsuit over a ten dollar trophy that, that my wife won on a marathon race, uh, seems like a century ago. 
but uh, I had Judge, judge Wapner, the TV judge, he was our judge. And um, I mean, I've sued over, <laughs> I've sued over Great Danes, I've sued over Boundary Lines, I've sued over, I've sued over a lot of different things because it's important to me. I don't like to get jerked around. I don't like to get screwed around. I just don't. I mean, I won't. And this is before I had any money. I made that suit lawsuit long before I had any serious money. I didn't develop these character traits just going, I got rich. I mean, I've had them. That's why you're rich. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And most people, we've been conditioned we're afraid of litigation. We don't want to, you know, with lawyers. Uh, whenever I go to Virginia Country Club, Hoffman's not here now. Uh, he says, "I hope to God, Dan, that Virginia Country Club never gets a copy of this, because he says you, because." But whenever I go to Virginia, every table in the grill they're complaining about lawyers. Every single day, it just gripes me, because you know, lawyers this, lawyers that. Lawyers are a tool to be used effectively in running a business. It's that simple. Sometimes it's at a proactive way. Sometimes it's in an administrative way. In my place, it was never on a defensive way. I mean, and, and I've been in so many, I know the law pretty well. I mean, when you've been in court as many times as I have, like when Raul signed that, uh, I couldn't believe Raul, the, the, the group of four of the guys that I'm, I'm working with, they signed some letter of intent on something and one of them brought it by to me to look at, and I looked at it and I said, was Raul there? He's the Harvard lawyer, the ki young kid that was here. I said, he was there and you signed this thing? Yeah. He says, what's wrong with it? And I said, there's nothing right with it. What do you mean, what's wrong with it? And I says, Raul was sitting there when you signed this? He let you sign this? He says, no, he signed a copy too. I said, Jesus, oh, I couldn't believe it. And then, 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 uh, but then he says, then uh, Fidel, took the blame. He says, well, I, I was so hyped up. I was so enthusiastic. I got everybody to sign it. And, right. Yeah. And I said, yeah. God, and that's good because I'm trying to teach them how to be enthusiastic. And they were so proud. They thought I was going to be so happy with them. Then I said, well, we got to get out of this deal. So, but then I, we, we worked and I, we, we, we role played and we went in there and they signed a new deal and they doofus the guy. They clipped the much more experienced groups wings. And these these four guys, uh, the, the amount of business the acumen they've got. I mean, Dan Jr. Well, Dan Jr. is pretty sophisticated. My eight-year-old daughter's got more. But um, but using it positively, it's just another tool. Uh, Dan, I wanted to ask you, uh, who was your mentor before you became wealthy? Well, one of them is in the. Uh, well, I already had a few bucks when I met Mr. Ormond, but uh, Mr. Ormond, who's in the back of the room, has been my mentor in the energy business. Uh, going on 20 years now. Um, Costa Grazos, who uh, um, um, I told you about, who was my general business mentor from Onassa Shipping Lines, <clears throat> and Jim Newman, get your head out, screwed on straight mentor. And those were my three mentors. I really didn't have any, I had a mentor in the military. I had a guy named General Roy Atterbury, West Pointer, his claim to fame, he graduated from West Point with the most demerits of anybody that ever went through West Point. You know, Douglas MacArthur, uh, general Robert E. Lee graduated with no demerits at West Point. This guy had the most demerits of any general, anybody ever to get to West Point. And he was a decorated hero from the Korean War, and he had his leg all shot up. And he used to, uh, didn't button his blouse. He used to, he was a general, can well, a general officer in the Constitution, by the Constitution says, you can have, a general can make his own uniform up. That's why Patton had all this junk he used to wear. Well, he used to keep his blouse open, his coat, and he used to drop cigar ashes and burn holes in his shirt and tie. And old Roy, Pina, where's Pina? Where's Pina? And he was a good guy, even though he was a slob, he was a good guy and he, and, and he, um, he's one of the reasons I wanted to stay in the army, be a career officer. But, uh, so he was kind of a mentor for me and he, he, he helped me and, and said, Pina, keep your name Pina. We, we don't like Mexicans, he's from Texas. Mexicans. Army, we got too many Mexican officers as it is. How many we got general officers? None. We got too many. Like I said, none. <laughs> he was from, uh, I forget, some place in Texas. He was a funny guy. But I, he helped. I had a mentor in school, Dr. Jim Bennett, who unfortunately couldn't make it because he was at some other conference. 
he helped me in school. He was the first guy to have faith in me that I was really brighter than my family thought I was. And um, I, um, he allowed me to take 26 units a semester to try to finish my degree in two and a half years. 26 units load, which was full load at that time was 12. And uh, I went to two schools at the same time, UCLA and Cal State Northridge. And he had a lot of faith in me. He was a man, he's still a very good friend. He was one of the original board of directors of Great Western Energy as well. And um, he's been a mentor of mine and a good friend from a lot, a lot of years. And if he was here, he'd tell you, Dan has not changed one one-tenth of a percent since the 60s when I was in college. Haven't changed. The only thing is about my, my, um, my accomplishments, accomplishments have caught up with my mouth. That's, 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 a, write that down. That's a good one. My accomplishments have caught up with my mouth. And they, because they have, you know. Now in my career, I don't have to prove anything to anybody. I've been there, I've done that in spades. And I can answer your questions, I mean, because I've been there, I've done that. I mean, I haven't heard, and I've done this now, I don't know, 30 times, 35 times, and I've been in front of a lot, a lot of people. And even before this, and when I was doing it, when I was the CEO of Great Western, I've never been asked a question I couldn't answer. I've never been given a business situation that I haven't been in personally. I haven't. I mean, now the doctor might tell about an ankle surgery or something. I haven't been that, but growing, starting that business, I know how to do that. Whether, you know, um, I know how to do that because I've done that. I've been with a small business. I've been, you know, I've run big business. And I've run a lot of them, and I know that, uh, so the things that I talk about, I, I can say with no qualifications or reservations, and more important, and I think more importantly than that, is that not just I say it with, in, a, in a forceful uh, manner, but I've, I know what doesn't work. And that's more important than anything else I can tell you, <laughs> what doesn't work. You know, you know what works, a lot of things work for you now. It's what doesn't, I can tell you what doesn't work. Don't do this. I mean, because I've done that, or I've had friends that do it, done it that way, or Grazos told me, and I, well, have you, one, one person once asked me at a seminar a few months ago, well, just because Grazos, Grazos said so, I mean, did you ever try it yourself? I go, nope. Why? <laughs> well, when the CEO of one of the largest companies in the world tells me that he tried this several times, and it didn't work, and it cost them $25 million, or whatever. I just don't need to experience that. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think I'm smart, and, but I don't think, you know, Ariel Onassis and Costa Grasso were pretty smart. They built a pretty big organization. And um, I just, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to, my ego is not that big that I need to try to say, well, I did something that Ariel Onassis failed at. I mean, because likelihood is that I'll fail too. So, I mean, I just don't need to go through that learning curve. See, sometimes, you know when you tell a kid don't do that, he's gonna get burned, he does it anyway. In business, you'll go to these, some, and listen to some of these people and you do it anyway. I, never, I could never understand why. Of course, look at me. Instead of making more refineries, I go in the movie business. I mean, I think I would have been better if I would have been in the movie business if I had been single. I didn't even get much, I didn't get any benefit out of being in the movie business because I was married and Linda used to travel with me in those years because before we had kids. I mean, single in the movie business, might, you know, I don't know if it'd been worth $25 million, but <laughs> I mean, huh? but um, so, I mean, that's uh, the benefit. And, and the things that you, that you find yourself struggling with, hard to do, they're the same things all the audiences struggle with. We've been raised to have low expectations of ourselves, you know, our, you know, and uh, it, it's like, we want our kids to go to a good school, at least the way, you know, not, I wasn't raised this way because I wasn't expected to go to any school. But then after that, especially in the minorities, after they go to the good school, and I'm not saying that education is mandatory, then there's no, there's no focus or no plan to get rich after going to a good school. They just leave it at that. You went to a good school. Well, what's the use of going to a good school if you're not gonna do something with it? Unless you're gonna, if you're gonna teach, you know, I tried teaching one year and I couldn't take it because I got so frustrated with this youth of America. They were all going in the toilet. Yes, ma'am. How many hours did you, um, when you first 
make out your men are, that you uh, spent time with, about how many hours? Gary, how many hours a, a week or a month or that we used to spend when, we, when you were teaching me the all men is? Excuse me. Considerable. <laughs> yeah, I spent a lot of time with them. We used to have lunch all the time, play golf all the time. I used to... It wasn't unusual to work 12, 14 hours a day. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the uh, and I was coming. More than that. Yeah, I used to fly to Dallas when his corporate headquarters was in Dallas, and spend time with him, and and uh, and to a lesser extent than his youngest son Ron used to spend time with me, and because he, his father and rightfully so set him on this track, and it was the Wall Street track, NBA Wall Street track, and that's the track I w came from. So I used to spend time, I remember being in Dallas with Linda having breakfast with young Ron and come over, I'm thinking of making this change and I'm doing this, and dad says I should finish my MBA at UCLA, and I said, your dad's right, and, and for him it was right, it was right, and he's doing very well, he's at Oppenheimer. I, I sat on next to him about a year ago on a plane, and I looked over, I said, God, that looks like Ronnie Orman, but he, God, he looks tired. And he said, yeah. And I said, he says, Dan, is that you? He says, yeah. He said, yeah, this is my third trip in five days, New York to L.A. I said, well, I've been that. I know how to do that. I said, you know, what you got to do is you got to have a couple of drinks, go to sleep or whatever. And, uh, but, um, yeah, so we spent a lot of time together. And um, Have you ever met Esty Lauder? No. No? No, I haven't. I haven't. Mm -hmm. In the back of the room. Dan, how did you fuck the mafia? Well, in uh, 1982 or three, we had a gentleman who will remain nameless to protect the guilty who sold one of our deals to uh, uh, the number three guy in one of the big mafia families in New York City, unbeknownst to me. And then when oil was $40 a barrel, it had letters of credit attached to it, so if the oil price oil fell, the letters of credit were called. Needless to say, oil went from 40 to 20 like it had a rock on its neck. And so they were called, and, they, and the banks are calling this guy's accountants and said that, uh, you know, called, and he, he, he had bought personally $500,000, and he felt so proud about it, he went over to a cousin or a, a distant relative, one of the other mafia families, and they bought about $2 million of it. And so um, he said that, uh, and the guy that sold it to him, he says, you don't have to worry. Well, now, when you tell somebody in, in a crime family you don't have to worry, it means that they're not going to lose any money. And so he flew out to see me in, um, in Los Angeles. I was in Scotland, and I get a phone call from Charlie Soliday. And he's whispering, Dan, Dan, Dan. I go, what? They're here. They're here. Why come speak up? What the hell's wrong? And he says, they're here. They want to talk to you. They want their money back. And I said, who's there? And he told me who it was. And I said, okay, I'll get in a plane. I left Scotland. I flew to Los Angeles. And so I walked in the, in the room, and I walked in the conference room looking around. Where are they? They're in your office. They set up a shop in your office. In my office? Who told them they could? Anyway, so I go in there, and, they, and he looked like uh, John Gotti. Short, portly guy, really well manicured, you know. And um, he gives me a big hug, and he says, what kind of name is Pena? And I says, well, um, and I told him, I says, but my grandfather, I'm one quarter Sicilian, which I am, my mother's father. And he t gives me another, he goes, too bad it's a not a half, uh, you know, because I'm one, I'm one quarter. And so, but we go out to dinner, and he says, he leans up to me, and he says, and I lean across the table like in the old E.F. Hutton commercials. I said, yes. He says, I want my money. <laughs> I said, I beg your pardon? He says, I want my money. <laughs> I said, uh, well, I can't give it to you. I mean, it's all pissed away. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and he said, we had just gone public, thank God. And I said, I run a public company. I can't just write you a check. And he says, you're not listening to me. I said, I'm listening anyway. So... We, we got uh, crossways, uh, so to speak, and, um, and the th funny things started happening, and we hired some people to, um, to um, protect us, and uh, we, we sent uh, some messages to them, uh, which were lo received loud and clear, and he says, this guy's crazy. He says, he's doing to us what we do to people, <laughs> and they said in the... In the uh, the bearer of these messages, who Lorraine knows, said he is crazy. He doesn't care. He's not giving me the money. He didn't think, think he did anything wrong. Make a long story short, he sued me for $144 million. And we fought it in the state court. 
in Texas to the Supreme Court of Texas, and we, and we, we fought it to uh, the Supreme Court in New York, and we fought it to the 12th and 8th District Appellate Courts. We fought for five and a half years, and the, the, the FBI and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the various people that were investigating them used to say this is the first time in, 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 in history that these guys have gone to court. They've been sued plenty, but they never sued anybody. And they went around and strong-armed all the limited partners into being part of this suit as a class action. <clears throat> they didn't come and say, do you want to be part of the class action? They said, this is your amount we need to check for your portion of it. <laughs> and they sued us, and we won. We won in all the courts. And, and then he got indicted, uh, thank God. And the... Um, <laughs> No heads in your bed. Pardon? No. Well, we had some. We had some. We had some. We had some difficult times. But then, during this whole process, I went to his restaurant. He owns a he owns a French restaurant in um, New Jersey. And um, and why are you going to his restaurant? I said because I want him to see that we're not afraid. He says, but Dan, we are. <laughs> it's only that you're not. And I said, so we went to his restaurant, Charlie, Mark, and I. And he came up and he saw me and he and he comes up to me and says. You've got a lot of balls coming here. I says, food not bad. He says, uh, and then he wouldn't. He says, I, I don't want your money. He says, uh, don't have dessert. Get out. <laughs> and so we didn't have dessert. We got out. And um, but uh, he's retired now. I mean, after he got indicted, and then when he got out of prison a year or so ago, or where? No, he didn't. Did he go to prison, Lloyd? I don't remember. Yeah, he went to prison. Yeah. Yeah, but that's how we did. But see, like I told you, one time I would have taken a bullet for the company. Almost did. And, but because at that time, the, the pay price to action, I would have done anything. When I said anything, I meant anything. And But, you know, we, we wiggled off that hook. And uh, But now when, and I've broken unions. I built a refinery in Lake Charles, Louisiana, non-union. And I mean, and, and uh, gun battles with mercenaries and all kinds of junk like that. And the, um, so when I go into these companies and say, we got a union problem, you know, the, the, where we were in the coal business was called um, Harlan County, Kentucky, it's called Blood County. That's where the unions got broke. I come in, they say, we got union problems. I mean, I've dealt with, I know how to, I know how to deal with unions. I mean, so there's, I know how to deal with organized crime. I mean, there's, I've been, I've been under a probe by the, uh, the uh, federal probe. Uh, by the state attorney, uh, uh, U.S. attorney, uh, uh, because some people we had done business with got indicted in uh, South Carolina. And uh, is that where Strom Thurmond's from? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm Strom. And um, I mean, I've, you know, um, the guy that uh, represented Ollie North, um, Brendan Sullivan, was my lawyer, my criminal lawyer. If I was, I was, if I was gonna get in a criminal beef, you could bet your ass I was gonna fi get the finest criminal lawyer that I could afford. And, you know, and um, I was forced, we paid a lot of money and the shareholders paid a lot of money, but the shareholders used to say, you know, Dan lives and dies by the sword. If we, we ride the hill up with him, we gotta ride the hill down with him. And so, we had plenty of that. So, I mean, there's nothing that can, I mean, I've had people leave their wives, I've had people plot to kill their wives. I mean, I've the, the other side, I mean, I, there's nothing in business or life that I haven't experienced growing these businesses, nothing. Absolutely nothing. I've had, you know, partners die, top employees die, God forbid we've had children die. I mean, I've seen all this. I've seen all this. And so to the extent, some of it I wish I hadn't seen, but I have. I've dealt with the Vatican. The Vatican screwed me in the only business deal I ever did with the Vatican. Costa Grazos, I think I've told this story to some of you, told me, he says, you got to get the $250,000 up front from the Vatican because they'll stiff you. You know, Catholic altar boy. I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even rash. I couldn't fathom that. And they did. They stuck it, man. They did, they stuck it up my backside. So, I mean, and I wound up having to put up the 250. I was in a, a joint venture with Imelda Marcos, Mobile Oil, Onassis Shipping Lines, the Vatican, and myself. And I and I put up the 250 for the Vatican because I didn't even check the letters of credit. I just assumed it would be there. I was dealing with Cardinal Men. Um, the guy got in all the trouble for the Italian bank thing. Oh, man. Mancinco, man, whatever that guy's name. You know, I learned now, I mean, I, unless Christ, and he better be able to prove it to me, he's Christ. <laughs> you know, if Christ came down through the ceiling here with a halo and the thorns, he better have ID. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
he better have ID. Otherwise, I mean, he better just have ID. Because, but I mean, um, you know, even Big, Big Bang, Citibank has, you know, stuck it up me. Uh, of course, Citibank would say I've stuck it up them more than they stuck it up me, but the, um, uh, dealt with all these foreign countries, all these foreign governments, and always come out on top. So I got a lot, of, I mean, that's a wealth of experience. That's why people want to be my partner. That's why, that's the only reason that anybody should want to give me any equity in anything, and then I give them to you, I'm gonna, I earn it. But I mean, these other guys, that's, uh, I, I, you heard me screaming, there's this lady that's a, a business development coach that, that, uh, that is running around sending all these pamphlets out. <laughs> Kellyanne, my eight-year-old daughter, has got more experience than she does. And everybody's got a right to make a living, but I mean, and I think when you're, when you're talking about growing businesses, because what if you, see, I'm going to be wrong. These people are going to be wrong more than I am. It's not fair to the people that put up the money. It just isn't. I mean, you deserve the best you can get. Now, you happen to get this inexpensively because we're testing a new price market. You don't, this isn't obviously the $10,000 deal. But I mean, it's essentially the same, you know, much of the same information. I mean, maybe 40 or 50% of what you covered here is in my $10,000, $15,000 seminar. But, um, the, uh, but you, you've got the nuts and bolts and you have the tools and there's no excuse come Monday why you, you, you can't be a different business person. So you should say businessman. See, look at how, look at how 90s I'm getting. Yeah, yeah. And it, there's there's no reason because you've got those you've got those tools, Jerry Ormond, I mean, who's been in business a lot longer than I have since you know, since a long time ago. I mean, he you know if somebody like if Jerry was doing these kind of seminars, he's be worth be worth listening to. You you you'd garner so much, glean so much experience. It'd be it would be tremendous for you but i mean guys like jerry aren't running around doing this at least i don't haven't met anybody if anybody in this room knows of anybody that's doing this that has experience that's anywhere near mine let me know i mean um and um, they just not yes sir um i think first or second day you were talking about interviewing people when you hire them you ask them questions like are you gay you got aids and stuff like yeah, that yeah i ask all those have you ever been sued for that no they are no 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 i have one time I got sued um, by a woman. Remember Maida Sarah Linda? That girl that said that she not out about it, got raped on the front on the hood of our car out in front of and the guy that supposedly raped her just was here a little ago. I, there was no rape that went on. But uh, I got sued the only sexual harassment I've been sued I I've had three employees that said they got raped, not by me, but by employees, but they sued me because I made the environment conducive to rape or some shit. Yeah, which I, I didn't, we beat those, I mean, those were easily, they just wanted to be paid off. But those are the only three uh, type sexual harassment suits I've ever been involved. So when you're asking these questions, I mean, what do people do? I mean... You know what they say? Yes, I am gay, no, I'm not, no, I'm HG, uh, uh, positive. positive, negative. That's how they answer. I've never had anybody say, I don't have to answer that. Don't let the door hit you in the damn ass on the way out then, youngster. Okay. You say you ask religion. Does, does that no, well, no, if, if, if I, uh, we come in with a Buddhist that can't work, you know, we come, you know, first of all, you shouldn't be coming to inter interview with, with anybody in my organization, you come in dressed like that, <laughs> and it's not that we're against them because, but I mean, that's not how we dress, you know what I mean, or you come in like um, that, that crazy stuff, uh, who's the convicted killer that, uh, the king, no, who's the uh, fight promoter that's the convicted murderer, the black guy, Don Tyson, yeah, no, 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 Don King's a convicted murderer. Yeah, you come in dressed like when he wears all that crap, you know, that he wears with his hair. I mean, you ain't going to get the job. I don't care if you're the most qualified guy that walks the face of the earth. You're just not getting the job. You don't fit in the mold. I can't see you sitting in my living room with hair that goes up like this and all that African garb on. I mean, that ain't going to do it. You know, and it's not that I'm bigoted or biased or anything. It just, you know, I ain't gonna, I'm not going to be flying from here to London with you, sitting in first class. <laughs> it just ain't going to happen. I just, I mean, you know, it just as if you come with a sombrero and a serape and a shit, tacos, it ain't going to happen. You ain't going to be working for me, you know? What do you think of Don King's business practices? I think that they're probably corrupt. Yep. Yep, I think so. I think that...
whatever yeah. it takes. Yeah, he does whatever it yeah. takes, but I mean, he steps over, you know, he steps over the line. I mean, uh, pardon? Yep, I met him at the Tyson, um, the first or uh, second fight that Tyson had at the Caesars Palace. Yeah, I have met him. Yeah, and uh, the, um, I'm trying to think who Tyson knocked out in the second round, that big guy. Michael Spence? No, no, be before that. Yeah, no, no. I know Larry Holmes, too, but um, he's a nice man. Larry's a nice guy. I hope he doesn't get hurt in this next fight. Somebody... Uh, Ruben? Mark and I were asking before, um, all the people you mentioned, sorry, of all the people you mentioned before in terms of high performance people and people who make money and you were asked a question about Don King, but we were wondering if you, what's your, your opinion of Steve Wynn and... You mean the guy, the, 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 uh, the gambling. The gambling guy. Yeah. Well, he's a smart guy. I don't, I don't know about his business practic pra practi um, practices. I don't know about that, but I know he's a smart guy and he's put together a lot of big deals and they all told him you can't build a 5,000 room, you can't build a 3,000, you can't, and he continues to do it. So, I mean, um, he's pretty much, I think, I think Las Vegas is a good example of going against conventional wisdom. A thousand room hotel wasn't supposed to work there. Florida. Yeah, I mean, I mean, do you think he care? I mean, he doesn't care what anybody thinks. He does what he thinks. Or he does what you know, two or three people that he deals works closely with. Um, Kerkorian, he's another psycho. He doesn't care. I mean, you know, uh, he lost six hundred million dollars in one of his recent deals, and he doesn't care. You know. Yep, yep. And and and, and Kirk is a, is a good client of Bear Stearns. He has been for a long, long time. And but. Um, Bear Stearns wouldn't underwrite his last deal. So he went to somebody else after 19 years of doing deals there. Now, whoever made that decision, I'm sure got blown out of Bear Stearns, no question. I can't imagine they would have done that. You know, the guy's paid hundreds and billions of dollars in fees. That guy, that managing, that young 30-year-old Harvard MBA managing director had a short career on Wall Street. That guy is history. I mean, and th nobody will hire him because anybody's got that piss poor judgment, nobody's going to want him. You know, obviously, the Kirk Coin deal was a huge success. And, but he did not do the deal just because Bear Stearns told him not. To. He went someplace else and did it very successfully. You mean they believe in God? Yeah. No. They, I, I don't know any of them that are agnostic, but I don't think that you'd call them seriously spiritual. They're about as spiritual as I am. Pardon? Yeah, like J.C. Kenny. He was supposed to be very... Well, I didn't know him. It's a little before my time. <laughs> huh? you got to use the mic. Now let's go stop with this crap, okay? But all these guys, by the way, swear... And that's why I swear in my seminars most of the time. Because they all, oh, this is what business is like. And if the women want to get with it, the program, it's like uh, the number, uh, uh, I'm trying to think if it's the, the one lady CEO of Fortune 500. There, there, she told them an example that when she was a chief financial officer, they were talking about giving bonuses. And this, this guy, her boss said, well, I'd like to give this bonus to this little cutie pie because she's got a nice ass, he, he said to her. And this was in, like, a Newsweek magazine. And so when they came around and they were talking about the people she wanted to give bonuses, she says, yeah, I'd like to give... And they all said, oh, that guy doesn't need a bonus. He says, yeah, I'd like to give that guy a bonus because he's well hung. <laughs> and, yes, and, 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 uh, and she's, she's saying this to Newsweek. It's not a story. She's saying it. And I said... And I said, I guess, well, I know why she's the only Fortune 500 CEO. And, um, but there are not many women like that, I can assure you. I've only read about it. I've never heard when no woman business that I've ever dealt with, with one exception, has ever used talk like that. I mean, I never, yeah, especially the Newsweek, I mean. But uh, she's supposed to be really rough and tumble, a rough and tumble lady. Um, the, I think it was the first day we were here, you were saying that most people fish with fishing poles and you fish with nets. Yes. 
No, I said most people fish with their finger down in the water <laughs> with no <laughs> bait on it, and they, they expect the, the fish to jump up on their finger. Yeah. Some people fish with a hook down there and no bait. Some fish with a hook with bait. Some fish with a fishing pole, and I fish with nets. And then you said you're changing your strategies from what you used to? Well, no. What I said was the mouth from the south, Ted Turner, when I heard him say to me a couple years ago, Dan, my daddy left me two things when he died, $2 million, which took him 51 years to make, and number two, he left me with the idea that, Teddy, don't set goals that you can, uh, that you can achieve in your lifetime. And I said, that's changed my way of thinking. It's given me a, a new lease on life vis-a-vis -vis what I want to do, as much as I've already accomplished. I've only scratched the surface. That's how it's given me a change in my strategy going forward. And, and part of that strategy, and the young, young men that I'm doing business with now are benefiting from that, because I probably wouldn't have had the foresight to turn over operations to as young and inexperienced uh, men that I do now. I probably wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have been willing to take the chance. See, I would have looked at it that way instead of giving myself a chance. But now I can do five or six times more than just monitoring two or three people or two or three projects. Personally. <clears throat> so it's really given me the opportunity. And so that's how I've changed because I fully expect fire resources to go beyond my lifetime. I mean, kick uh, DuPont's ass and, and spin-offs and all kinds of things from that. And uh, there's other things that I'll be doing with the, the other young men that I'm working with. And, um, the, um, and it's interesting that there are only young men. I, I haven't found any young women. And I'm not saying that I'm looking for them, but I haven't found any. And the, um, uh, but then there's not that many young women or middle-aged or old women, for that matter, that are, that are, that are, that are willing to, t to pay that price that, that I need to see. I need to see that. I need to see John Mosby said, yeah, I'm going to get married in a few days, but I'll have my ass there. I need to see that, you know. It's got to pass the doofus test. And, and I'm, you know, and I shouldn't say this in closing because this is kind of a ratty thing to say, but the, in my, my 24 years in business, with all the successes I've had, I've never had a man say that he couldn't close a deal because when his mother died or because, uh, you know, when he had a bisectomy. I've been in a lot of deals with women I got to have a hysterectomy, I got to have this, my mama died, I got to go be with her. I never heard a man, ever, in all my life, say that. And yet I've heard it many times from women. That's why there's not more women Fortune 500 CEOs. Because I assure you that bitch that's running that one company, <laughs> uh, and the company's called uh, Wanako, or I forget what the name of the company is, I mean... I don't think she'd be go. You spend much time at her mama's funeral. I just don't think so. That I don't think she'd be. In a nice way. What? That bitch in a nice way. Of course. Yeah, of course. Ms. See, Ms. the. Ms. See, Ms. pardon? Ms. Bitch. Ms. Ms. Bitch. And so I just don't think so. And uh, you know what's that? My mother says, "A daughter's a daughter the rest of her life. A son's a son until he takes a wife." Uh, you know? Yeah. And, you know, old school, you know. But, so, uh, that's why. But I, I've, I've seen that commitment um, in, in young men. Not just young men, but in men. Many more men than I have ever seen it in women. Any other questions? Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I don't know if Ed still wants uh, is anybody that will give it, you know, talk on the, on the uh, film. The answer is yes. If you do that, I'd appreciate it. Um, and um, I'm going to be um, probably doing this, not probably, I'll be doing this a number of times next year. I've uh, got a couple more appearances this year. I think one in La we still doing that Las Vegas and San Diego thing? We're not doing Las Vegas and San Diego, probably. Yeah. So, um, thank you very much. Go out there and rip them.